thank you all for coming. I'm quite excited to be here in this day with all of you. Oh, I'm already crying. Okay, so today all right, we're gonna talk about birds and can I close this? I don't know. Or hide this? No, no. The next one down. Floating meeting. Oh, that, yeah. <sighs> okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, also in Zoom. Love you all. So we're going to talk about birds and, yeah, evolution and ecology. And I guess uh, I appreciate uh, Town's introduction and my time here. I have had a lot of fun. And the idea is to show you some of my doctoral research with these guys that some might say I've been obsessed with, uh, Orpendulus Anka 6. Here we go. Okay, so um, birds and how they reproduce. So usually uh, birds are monogamous. That means they for one pair, one male, one female. They nest solitarily and uh, both parents take care of their uh, chicks or offspring. And this is what we call a mating system, basically a set of interactions between individuals that are centered on reproduction. However, I wouldn't put these pictures if there was not a trick behind, right? So yes, uh, penguins are monogamous, but they're colonial. And for the bird people out there, they know that that's a hummingbird nest and mom is the only one providing food to offspring in hummingbirds in general. And that's a red winged blackbird. And I talk about red winged blackbirds. And that's a special case or an, a special instance of a male red winged blackbird feeding a chick. In general, they're polygynous and males do not provide food to the uh, fledglings. So we know that monogamy is common, but they are alternative mating systems or breeding systems social systems, I'm gonna refer broadly to them as mating systems. Around 50% of the birds of the war are colonial and less than a third is non-monogamous. Um, why does that matter? Well, studying alternative mating systems, uh, we've learned a ton about, about different processes. So uh, Studying roughs, we learn about alternative phenotypes and strategies about uh, secretive males, uh, uh, but also start, uh, studying jays, we learn about kin selection and sex bias dispersal. And here I want to make the distinction between what is a social mating system and a genetic mating system. So social mating system is what we see, basically what is obvious to a researcher. Yeah, these two birds nest together and mate, have chicks, but the genetic mating system is what is actually happening, right? How genes are passing to uh, uh, the next generation. And if we have uh, inconspicuous behaviors, for example, it's through pair copulation, uh, that monogamous or that social monogamous system will not be actually monogamy, right? So polygyny. The probably the non-monogamous system that has been the most studied. And it's quite simple. And then there are many classifications on polygyny, but the idea is that uh, in polygyny, males compete for access to females. So one male mates with multiple females. And these are examples of that. Um, in these systems, there's high competition high intrasexual competition among males, and that increases sexual selection, and then the variance in reproductive success of these males increase. What that means is that some males mate a lot, few males actually, and most males don't mate or mate with one female. That system is characterized uh, by a reduction in the effective population size of populations and a reduction in the genetic diversity of populations. So, We'll talk about polygynous systems today quite a bit. 
But uh, classically or traditionally, these mating systems have been studied from the local perspective, from uh, the availability or distribution of resources and the aggravations of it. So this is a classical plot from, or a plot from a classic from Emlyn and Lauren, where you'll see in the X axis how resources are distributed. They're either clumped or dispersed. And in the Y axis, you'll see the temporal availability of male mates. What that means is do, in this case for polygyny, females group and does that facilitate polygyny? So when resources are clumped, uh, resources related to reproduction, and where mates are clumped in space or time, there is a higher potential for polygamy in that case, but we're talking about polygyny here. And so the idea is that reproductive success of males depends on the distribution, both in time and space, of these resources. Uh, Emling and Oring also mentioned that they are, there were phylogenetic factors. And um, I want to uh, talk about to them as factors that add at macro scales. Basically, we see that in, uh, for example, colonial birds, penguins again, are uh, usually not randomly distributed across birds family. What we see is that in general, sea birds are colonial, but passerines are not. Or mannequins and cotingidas and birds of paradise, they're usually frugivorous. And in those species, we see uh, polygenous systems. So there's some uh, phylogenetic component to the kind of mating system we see, we see within a family or a radiation. There's also a geographic variation in resources or conditions, and that might be related to the geographic variation that we see in mating systems. For example, the acorn woodpecker, which depends on acorns, so acorn distribution, <laughs> shows monogamy, polygyny, and a mid small mid mating system called polygynandry. I'm not gonna go there, but it's complex. Okay, so moving on. The aim of this doctoral research has been to study these factors that are at macro scales, so large scales, large scale factors in space and time that affect uh, mating systems in this beautiful radiation. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'll talk a bit about uh, the study system. And then um, I'll uh, mention some, some results of my three chapters. The first is uh, in the phylogenetics of the subfamily that is uh, made of Cassix and Oropendulas. Second chapter is on the genetic diversity and differentiation patterns that uh, we seen in two focal species of uh, Cassix and Oropendulas. And the third chapter, it's related to niche and geographic distributions of these uh, lineages. The end, some take home, hopefully, and some acknowledgement. Okay, best group ever, Cassix and Oropendulas. So we have three genera, Saracolius, Ardio Oropendulas, Cassicus and Cassiculus are the Cassix. They are neotropical. That means they are in this side of the world, mostly from Mexico to Argentina. And there are around 20 species, I'm gonna move my mouse. Uh, most of them are in lowlands. And in this map, what I'm showing is each dot that is actually a pixel of 10 minute resolution shows the number of species you can find uh, in that exact position. So Colombia has the highest diversity of Cassix and Oropendulas and in one pixel you can find 10, which sounds wonderful. Uh, but I actually wanna show this map to uh, kind of illustrate the gaps of knowledge we have. These are really obvious conspicuous birds and still most of their distributions are not well characterized. And I should say from that map, four species are the, one that, the ones that are making most of those points. Uh, importantly, these birds are usually or are mostly in lowlands, South American lowlands in particular, but there are 
some species that uh, are mountain. And one, and this was what attracted me uh, into the study or that drew me to, the, to study these systems was that these birds, most of them, 80% of the species are both colonial and polygynous. And that's uncommon. Most passerines are not colonial nor polygynous. So that combination was interesting from the start. Uh, briefly, there are at least three mating systems within this 20 species radiation. Female defense polygyny, that's your typical mammal mating system where one male defends a group of females. And that's rare. The Montezuma or Pendola uh, shows this mating system and it's one of the maybe 10 species from 10,000, depending on your classification, uh, <laughs> that uh, exhibits this mating system. And there's also sequential polygyny and what we call social monogamy in Casicus solitarius. Related to this mating system, so just within this radiation, we see that uh, <clears throat> when females aggregate, when there's a clump distribution of nesting females, uh, we also see polygyny. So this uh, clump distribution promotes polygyny. And that's more or less how, well, I think on the bottom right, you can see how a nest looks. Uh, that's pretty conserved. And on the bottom left, you'll see a huge colony of Montezuma or Pendolas. So the idea is in that colony, in those colonies, sorry, the proportion of females is way higher. The number of females, sorry, is way higher than the number of males. These species really like isolated trees or nesting sites. And there are a couple of works that have shown uh, how the position or the, isolate, the degree of isolation of these sites is related to colony size. So think about isolated colonies uh, have a higher number of nests and that is potentially related to a higher degree of polygyny. So one male can monopolize more females uh, in a large colony. So we have two extremes, or dear Montezuma or Pendola and our Casicus solitarius, best epithet ever. However, they are again mountain species that seem to be an exception. And uh, in highlands, these three species show alternative nesting strategies. They either have scattered colonies, so the colonies are not in one isolated tree, but spread across a line of trees that is, or an edge, a, a forest edge. Uh, their colonies are smaller sometimes, or they swap between solitary nesting and coloniality. So given that background, factors in large scales, I'm gonna talk about evolution history, regional demographic processes that affect these mating systems, and also how climatic, abiotic, abiotic conditions uh, set the stage for these mating systems across geography. Moving on in the outline, let's go with chapter one. The phylogenetics of Cassissimi, mm -hmm. which is the subfamily of Cassix and Oropendolis. So we have a couple of questions here. First, we want to see if, or we want to confirm if uh, species are related, share these nesting patterns. So if, either if they are colonial or solitary. And uh, we want to check if the uh, within the radiation, the species that have spread to mountains have done that independently. This is the current uh, phylogeny of Cassicine. And it's a multi-locus uh, phylogeny based mostly on mito mitochondrial markers with some nuclear markers. 
uh, it proved many things in uh, among the among that there's the monophyly of the subfamily, but there are some unresolved uh, relationships within, particularly within Casicus, that have received either low support or are not super clear. And there are uh, several subspecies that were not some, uh, uh, sampled um, in that effort. So we thought, uh, let's try to do that. Let's try to do a comprehensive, let's try to build a comprehensive phylogenetic framework. So here are some of the methods of this chapter. Hmm. Honor to the library prep process of all of this, which took me a while, but we're good. <laughs> um, we did here uh, ultra conserved elements, mitogenomes, and uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms from those uh, ultra conserved elements. Uh, I can talk about this uh, later with anybody if they like, but. First result, what we got here is a full, let's say, comprehensive phylogeny. So, including all the all the currently recognized subspecies of the subfamily have been included. And in general, UCs, uh, mitogenomes, and SNPs gave uh, consistent results. We found the relationships of five unsampled subspecies until now. And we have some issues like long branches in UC reconstructions, but then uh, the SNP tree solved that. And some internodes were short, but they were validated with concordance factors. So uh, we have in pretty good standing now in terms of the relationship among these taxa. And uh, going in depth uh, or going inside each of these genera, the first result is that, uh, yes, colonial caciques or colonial caciques are uh, monophyletic. So what we see is that in the bottom, there are um, eight species or taxa for now that are show colonial coloniality. And this has been confirmed by all markers uh, or all the markers that we use. Uh, within this clay, though, there are taxa that do that have facultative coloniality. Again, that means that they swap. Some populations are solitary, and some populations are colonial. Uh, and in those populations, colony size <laughs> is uh, uh, smaller, right? So they get until six, ten nests. Instead, lowland caciques can be can have colonies of seventy five. Moreover, we see that within Casicus, the two mountain tags are strictly mountain uh, uh, ar arrive or spread to these regions independently. They are within that clade, non closely related. And we also see that in Sarocolius. So Sarocolius atrovidens is a strictly mountain, and uh, it also uh, arrives there. We, or at least its ancestor, that's something that needs to be cleared out in the future, hopefully. Um, and I'm showing their, their elevational ranges. So that's in meters, I'm sorry. But very good. All right. So the important thing about that last part is that these three strictly montane taxa are uh, show different nesting patterns that seem recurrent. So the caciques or orpandalas that have spread to uh, mon mon mountains either have smaller colonies, all of them, the caciques will, will swap between solitary nesting and coloniality, and Sarcolis atrovidens will show these colonies in multiple trees. And uh, this might be a pattern that all, all other orpandalas uh, show uh, among different populations at different elevations. So in a study that we did in 2021, I guess that's when that came out uh, with Sorocolis de Cumanus, we saw these differences in high elevation uh, Sorocolis de Cumanus populations showing more multiple trees than what you see at sea level. All right, so 
to answer our questions? So yes, uh, related species share nesting patterns and these elevational shifts happen independently in this radiation. So bottom line uh, from this chapter is that, uh, yeah, history, evolutionary history matters. And in, at least in part, it determines which uh, nesting patterns and in consequence, which mating systems appear in a radiation. And importantly for the third chapter, we will see these stats uh, disperse the mountains at least three times independently. There's some future niche research that I will not talk about because the town told me not to. <laughs> All right, coming back to our outline, we'll talk about how in uh, large temporal scale, there are factors that set or affect this uh, mating system. So let's talk about some cool whole genome patterns. All right, so here I'm focusing on two different species. And I'm asking questions, I'm asking basically two questions that are related to within population diversity in this species and between population diversity. These are the target taxa of this chapter, Montezuma Oropendola, really exceptional, and Orcasicus solitarius. They are dramatically different because, well, you can see that the Montezuma Oropendola has colonies that can be of hundreds of nests, and in those colonies, males can mate with more than 50% of those females, one male. In this case, the solitary cacique mates with one female, generally. And these social mating systems are different. They are really different in size. Uh, Montezuma or Pendleton are the size of a crow. Um, solitary cassettes are about this big. Sorry, some people, this big. All right. And usually you'll see that cassettes, uh, this cassette, is quite shy and they are associated to riparian forests. Instead, you'll see Montezuma or Pendleton basically everywhere. Towns, uh, next to secondary forests, plantations, etc. So with that setting, we'll expect that uh, the oropendula will show low genetic diversity because why well, it's polygynous. So as I said before, with just one male every now and then passing its genes his, to the next generation, the effective population size will drop. And in the cacique, we'll spread higher divergence because it seems that these birds don't move that much. So this population in general should be more isolated. This is our sampling. So in the bottom uh, left in South America, we have three populations of Casicus solitarius that we analyze. And in Central America, and the upper right corner, we have three populations of Saracolis, Montezuma. Some of the methods, these populations, uh, each of these populations had three individuals with the illumina whole genome uh, resequencing, bunch, bunch, bunch of SNPs. And yeah, there are some details I'm not going to talk about. But again, if you have questions, we'd love to talk with you afterwards. OK, first result, totally unexpected. First hit my I've made. I was scared because this goes against all my intuition. Both species show kind of similar levels of nucleotide diversity, diversity within populations. So to guide you in these heat maps, basically the diagonal is diversity within population and each cell is one population. Uh, in the right, right, I mean left in zoom, uh, you have Montezuma, and even though the mean nucleotide diversity of this species was similar uh, doing some uh, pair tests, we actually show that Montezuma was more diverse than, than the cacique. Slightly, they are in the same uh, order of magnitude, but, but those populations had higher 
with higher nucleotide diversity, which was odd to me. So I decided, I was like, well, okay, let's, let's see what's happening uh, among populations. And uh, on, on the Casico side, that made more sense. Okay, yeah, I see some divergence. Uh, populations are more similar. So in the, uh, sorry, in the bottom right corner of these heat maps, basically those are comparisons between populations. Uh, so you have in the most bottom of the corners, you're comparing, we're comparing Bolivia against Paraguay, right? The main point is that that is the, the, the divergence value, basically how different these populations are. And of course, what you would expect in the Casicus set is that difference between populations are higher than difference within population. Yeah, individuals from the same populations are more similar. Makes sense. Uh, on the Montezuma side though, we don't see that. We see that populations seem to be as different within, no, individuals from the same population are, seem to be as different to individuals from the same population or individuals from other populations. That was again, really weird. But at least this took us to the next step because before we were saying, oh, they have uh, similar genetic diversity. But here we can see that, okay, it's similar in value, but it's structure or it's partition different. So here I'm showing a heat map. And this is on the y-axis, each of these dots show divergence between a pair of populations. In this case of Casicus. That heap, sorry, that Manhattan plot, that's not a heap, but that Manhattan plot uh, shows the chromosome, the largest chromosomes. So from chromosome one to 14 from the autosomes and chromosome Z, chromosome Z from the sex chromosomes. And the idea is that each of those red dots are windows of 50,000 kilo, 50,000 base pairs in which divergence was lower than nucleotide diversity. That means the differences between populations were lower, yeah, were lower than the difference within populations. Makes sense that there are few red points. This is how the Montezuma look. So that's around 40% of the windows. So what that means is that across the genome, we see uh, many regions in which populations are, or individuals, sorry, are less different to individuals from other populations than to their own. Again, really weird. So this was more or less a, an existential crisis. And then went to John's office many times. And it was like, he made the right suggestion. It's like, let's look inside populations. And this is how it looks. So again, K6 makes sense, some variability. And then there's this weird pattern in Montezuma. What's happening there is a diagonal in this case, now, now we have nine cells in the diagonal. That, those are the nine individuals of Montezuma, right? What that's saying is that individuals had really high individual variation. That is heterozygosity. What that means is that the individual's parents are more different between each other than that individual to any other individual, regardless of population. That explained the previous pattern, but it was weird. I was like, okay, so, but why, why are we getting that many individuals that are highly heterozygous? After a lot of cleaning, a lot of work, okay. And some reading, it turns out that it has been shown that in mammals and birds at least, that are polygynous, heterozygous males are favored. So what, that, what those studies have shown is that heterozygosity in males is related to better ranks, 
uh, males have more copulations, they sire more offspring, or they spend more time in breeding drugs in the case of uh, pinnipeds. So what this pattern is suggesting is that Montezuma, which is, I, 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 don't, know, I don't think there's a pastoring that is more polygynous than this one, is that males that are heterosexuals are being selected uh, in this system. And what could create that, those high levels of heterozygosity? Well, coming back, going back to the diver, divergence, sorry, uh, we think gene flow is a good uh, explanation for this. So that, what this means is that there is gene flow among populations of Montezuma. And if you think about it, moving to another population will, re, will increase your relative heterozygosity because you will be more different. Your parents will be really different to whatever you find, right? So you will be highly heterozygous. So what could create this? Male bias dispersal? Most birds have female bias dispersal. So that's weird. But most birds don't have female defense polygyny. And if we go back to the classics, that's what we see in mammals and in other species that show female defense polygyny, where males are the ones that disperse to other populations. What this means is that do we have difference in within population? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yes, yes. Okay, it's partition different. Are populations different between each other? Uh, yes. But the important part is that there is a demographic process, a regional scale that is changing the expectations. Well, they're searching the, the genetic mating system of these populations because in a classic cult perspective, populations will be isolated. So yes, in isolation, uh, polygynous population should have a drop in their effective population size. With gene flow, everything changed. So again, future neat research, I'm not gonna talk about. So now I've mentioned at least two things, two factors at large scales, time and space that affect mating systems. Now let's go geographic. Okay, so in this chapter, I have two main questions. One, are ecological niches conserved across the range? Because like, yeah, most are lowlands, but we see these species in the mountains. And also, uh, do abiotic conditions constrain the distribution of these mountain species? And what implications does that have for the nesting patterns and their mating systems? So just to recap, that's a map of species richness, uh, of the Cassisine, and most are in lowlands, but we have these three species, these three types of, that are strictly mountain. What we have, what we generally do here in this lab is we look at geography and we look at how conditions vary in geography, in this case, mean temperature. So, um, I ask what conditions are being occupied by Cassisian species? Well, Cassisian species are in that square between Mexico and Argentina. And we can take several climatic layers and create envir an environmental space. Well, not create, just plot it there. And we can think on these two spaces, geographical and environmental, as link spaces, and then see where species are in geography and where species are in that environmental space. That will give us a rough, simplistic estimate of their fundamental niche, which is the trait that could evolve. Just to guide you in that environmental space plot, bio one is temperature. So from the left um, bottom corner to the right upper corner, you'll see temperature increase. So the regions that are in the right uh, upper corner are hot. In the other diagonal, bio 12 is precipitation. 
you see that those two arms that that cloud of points have are really wet regions, regions are that experienced or sorry, where precipitation is quite high. So the right one is the Pacific uh, coast of Colombia, basically Chocó. Uh, the lower one is wet but cold, and those are the Pacific forests of Chile. So just to guide you through that, we'll see those ellipses for each species and see if they overlap or not. These are some of the methods. I put a GIF there because I like GIFs. Right. So this is just a general pattern, but like each of those ellipses or ellipsoids are for the 23 species that I analyzed. And the general pattern is that all of them are to the bottom upper right corner. So they're in lowlands. They occupy hot environments that are really rainy. Except those ones that are highlighted in blue, which are the mountain ones. You can see those ellipses are shipped to the center. And what that means is that these guys are living in colder conditions that are relatively drier compared to the other species in the radiation. Can we see that in bot plots? Yes, please. That's our tree. In yellow, I highlighted the mountain species and you can see that they have to the left the lowest mean or median uh, temperature, right? So they inhabit the coldest regions compared to, her, uh, to other species within the radiation. That makes total sense because that's what happens in mountains. Okay, so these estimates of the fundamental nature, of course, incomplete because they come from occurrences. So what we can do? Well, we can uh, account or take into account this uncertainty uh, if we consider the conditions that are within the regions that are accessed uh, by the species. So that previous gift was of one of those, which has been a topic I've been interested in for a little bit. Uh, accessible areas were uh, simulated here through dispersal simulations that's in a package that I developed with Marlon here. And we use it to obtain these regions where uh, species are either absent or present. But outside those, uh, Access, uh, sorry, accessible areas, we don't know. So those conditions are uncertain. And we try to incorporate this into uh, the estimations of fundamental niches using that other package. That is marvelous. Cool people here. All right. So again, accessible area in blue, areas where that species is absent in red where conditions are suitable for its presence and gray areas are outside that. And this, in this case, I'm showing just one dimension, which is temperature. Having that, having that, we can create a Carter matrix for, in this case, temperature. If we binarize, the ranges, binarize, binarize, make it means categories. And here I'm just highlighting the mountain species. So you can see that that red uh, tail of the range uh, gets to lower temperatures in those species. And with character matrices, we can do ancestral reconstructions of uh, ancestral niches. So the idea here is that with an input tree, and the ranges that are categorized for each of the branches, we can reconstruct the niche of the ancestors. And after reconstructing that, we can see if there's any difference. The niche expanded or retracted. In this case, I'm showing a difference that means a retraction. So the ancestor used to occupy hotter areas and the descendant doesn't tolerate those hot conditions anymore. 
And here I show the reconstruction that we obtain. So in general, um, not putting there all the differences and all the reconstruct all, all the reconstructed ranges, because what we saw was a widespread uh, pattern of uh, ecological niche conservatism. But I'm going to focus today on the few instances in which we saw or we uh, found niche evolution. And those are at least these three, again, mountain species in which we saw a retraction from the higher end of the thermal niche. What that means is that these species do not tolerate conditions as hot as the ones that their ancestors, their respective ancestors, did. How does that look in geography? So in current conditions, those purple areas show uh, are basically those proper areas have conditions or have temperatures that were tolerated or were suitable for the ancestors of those species and are not suitable anymore for these species. What that means is that uh, abiotic conditions and niche evolution are constraining the distribution of these species so they are not in, found in lowlands. And that connects with what I've been saying before. So because they went up there independently, right, to mountains, now they have other nesting strategies. Um, some might go back and forward to solitary nesting and monogamy, uh, but some others have found ways to still be polygynous just with a different nesting uh, organization, let's say, social organization. Okay, and why do we think that's happening? because in mountains, the distribution of these isolated trees is different, right? Like due to intrinsic factors of mountain areas, either a hydrography, topography, or just less patchiness, even species composition. So are ecological niches conserved across Kassisipi? Yes. Is the distribution constrained by abiotic conditions and niche evolution? Also, yes. So as a take home, yes, uh, distribution of ecology matters. No. Um, after thermal niche evolution and these species going independently upward, right? They are now restricted there and that has affected the nesting patterns and that has implications for the uh, degree of polygyny of these systems. So, more future research because never ends. And we're almost at the end. Okay. I hope that with this summary of my doctoral research, I'll show you that mating systems both genetic mating systems and social mating systems are affected by factors at large scales, macro scales, in time and space. Those can be uh, phylogenetic constraints. Those can be demographic processes happening at regional scales, or also climate and abiotic conditions that just restrict species distribution and the restrict the access to uh, resources that are important for reproduction. With that, stop acknowledgements. <sighs> okay, I need to thank all my sources of support for <laughs> uh, especially the uh, Natural History Museum and the department and also AOS. Uh, special thanks to the Engelmans for the Felipe uh, Gomez Opportunity Fund. All those museums uh, lend me tissues for my analysis and photos of specimens or access to specimens, and I value uh, their support uh, quite a lot. Uh, special thanks to people in the Berg Museum and LSU. 
those are uh, the photographers are showing those photos. Uh, I'm really thankful to uh, all the people in the Biodiversity Institute and in the department. Um, I'm also thankful for the faculty and staff of uh, this institution. All um, several of you are uh, mentors and friends, and I appreciate I appreciate you a lot. And I don't have battery. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that makes sense because, like now, if the screen goes off. You're not gonna see that I didn't put pictures of everybody. <laughs> so it's definitely that, not that I don't use Facebook or anything. Okay. Okay. Um, some help here. Because <laughs> this table is not gonna get there, I feel over there. Nope. The podium. This is weird. <laughs> I did tell him to bring power cord. He did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I was about to cry. Um, <laughs> that saved me. Okay. Uh, thanks to my committee for uh, all those times where I said, uh, you have five minutes and they were not five minutes. <laughs> uh, so thanks for keeping uh, your uh, doors open for, for me to ask questions. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> And, and thanks, uh, Jamie, for teaching me R and give structure to my code. Uh, thanks, uh, Jenny, for your enthusiasm and your support in this process. John, thank you for everything. Uh, for biometry. <laughs> Just as Thanks to biometry. I should put that just in my, yeah. right, Pietro? I, I'm not seeing the chat. But <laughs> he knows. Um, okay. So this is when the, the slides get whatever, uh, disorganized. I don't have pictures of all of you. So um, I'm sorry. I do appreciate everybody that is here. Everybody is in Zoom. Some people couldn't make it. I, I have you close to my heart. Thank you, Town. <laughs> don't, let, don't let me. Okay, don't let me start. The I, I'm winning the series. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for Pagnamon and thank you for for long conversations and and your friendship and your mentorship and all your support. Um, I really have ha, have been happy. Thank, thanks for. Um, yeah, just creating. Oh, fuck. You didn't hear that. <laughs> creating a community uh, where uh, we all feel we all feel like home. So, being away has been hard. Uh, I feel I felt like home. So, thank you for making Lawrence my home. Um, the e-name group is too big, so I'm not gonna name you guys. You, you know. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've named a couple. Uh, thank you to the two Daniels, the fake and the real one. <laughs> you know who you are. 
thank you to Marlon and Claudia and so many friends. Wow. Um, Guillermo and Rahul and I'm gonna forget so many people. Utku and John and well, I could just look at the pictures, I guess. <clears throat> thank you all. Hi, Ali. <sighs> okay. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Um, thanks to Jorge. I am where. So um, thank you for um, your constant um, support. And don't say gracias a ti. That he's, he's, he usually says, no, oh, thank you. <laughs> Freaking annoying. <laughs> so don't say the now or something like that. Thank you to all my Venezuelan friends that I miss a lot. Shout out to um, uh, Anna and Daniel, who has been our, who uh, have been an important, uh, more than important support uh, for me here. And many others, Male and, and Jorge and Rafa and, uh, and Miguel. Uh, and Malé and Ivan. I already said Malé, I feel. I'm repeating myself. Um, <sighs> thank you to, and I, I don't have a photo and that's Mark's fault. Thank you to the Ornithology Division. I'm gonna really miss Mark. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And I had a meme about Mark and Lucas, but it got lost. <laughs> It's all right, I'll print it. <laughs> so many good friends and really crappy photos, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, a lot of people here, and a lot of people in the screen and in Zoom are like family or our family. And I love you all. And sorry that I didn't do a better job, a, a better job with my acknowledgements. I'll write something in the dissertation or whatever. <laughs> uh, I do want to talk about someone. Um, oh, 54 minutes. I do want to talk about someone that is not any, uh, here anymore, but it's close and today is a, uh, Double five day, so I need to talk about Francisco. Um, he was the one that taught me about camera. So a lot of this work is dedicated to him. And um, miss your turn. Okay, and also thanks to my family. And again, I don't have a lot of photos. Oh, I have this one. <laughs> Thanks, Tata. And Lala and Lulu. And all my aunts and uncles and cousins. And I miss my sister a lot. I'm not making any sense. But yeah, look, look, Dad, I'm wearing a t shirt. Thank you for your support and your love. And that's all.